Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Hey Amen. Good morning. Edward's not here. He's on sabbatical. If you've been here the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about Edward's uh, five year, every five years, he gets a month off to refresh, relax, spend time with family, spend time with the Lord. And so from today until March 31st, he'll be gone. And um, I'm jealous, but I'm also happy for him at the same time. And if you were here five years ago when he came off of sabbatical, you know we're in for a treat when he gets back because God's, I just know God's going to pour into him as he rests in the Lord. And so you've got me for the month of March. All right. I just wanted to see. Yeah. You could have booed. I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to be comfortable in that. Um, so it, it, it's cool. Hey, uh, what Danielle failed to mention during her little talk about um, driving around the lake is that yesterday I spent four hours in my happy place. My happy place is on the zero turn mower, okay, cruising around, mowing stuff. I trimmed some bushes, and Edward and Danielle were stalking me the whole time. Their little drive around the lake ended up being, they were videoing me on my zero turn mower and laughing the whole time, which is fine. Like I said, I'm comfortable. If you can boo, you can laugh at me, you can do whatever you want. That's my happy place. I love yard work. I love spending time with the Lord. I had my headphones in. I couldn't even hear what they were saying. In fact, I was completely ignoring them because I was listening to podcasts and worship music and, and things like that. And as I finished up and as I sat on my front porch to admire the, the fruit of my labor, uh, it dawned on me that we're in a season. So Ash Wednesday was Wednesday. We're in Lent. Easter is six weeks away. We are in the season where dead things are about to come back to life. I'm going to throw some fertilizer down on that grass when I get home. It's going to rain tomorrow and Tuesday. And then that brown dead grass over the next few weeks is going to turn into a plush green I'm the only one that gets excited about this, aren't I? Hey, Jesus talked to plants, okay? I can get excited about my grass turning green. It's awesome. Yeah, thank you. All right, so, so we're in that season. And so six weeks. You're going to get five weeks. We're going to be doing a series. We're going to start a series. Five weeks, we're going to be talking about something, and that's going to lead us into Palm Sunday, and then that's going to lead us into Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday. Edward will be back for those last two. And so I'm, a, I'm inviting you today. You can say no. I'm inviting you today to jump on board, buckle up, and let's go for a ride over the next five weeks. It could get a little dangerous. It could get a little... Uh, that's the word I'm looking for. Tense. All right. But by the end of the message, I'm going to be asking you to jump on board. Okay. So be thinking about that. So I want to start with this. God is really, really cool in how he does things. I've been preparing for this series for about six months now. Knew the topics I wanted to hit. Knew the order that I wanted to hit them in. And this Friday, we are driving to McKinney to watch a uh, regional basketball game. And my daughter had three of her friends go with us. So it's me, Ashley, and four 10-year-old girls. Okay. Yeah, that enough will drive you crazy. But the conversation that was going on, I pulled out my phone. I know I shouldn't have. Ashley's freaking out. I go, you can't text and drive. And so I'm handing her the phone. I'm saying, type this down because this is sermon material. This is illustration material. I've got to share this. This is incredible. And so what was going on was Ainsley, how many of you are right fighters? You know what a right fighter is? You have to be right. Okay, just me. Awesome. All right. So, I'm getting better. 
All right, I am getting better. Ainsley's my 10-year-old girl. She's a spunky gal, a lot of energy, and she has to be right. And so the conversation between four 10-year-old girls that my daughter was the ringleader of went something like this. Where was God standing when he created the planet? Because the planet wasn't created yet, so he couldn't have been standing on it. So where was he standing? Then one of the girls chimed in, well, he wasn't standing anyway. I mean, God's a spirit, so he was just kind of doing his spirit thing, which another girl chimed in. No, he can't be a spirit. He's a person because we were created in his image. And then Ainsley right fighter, listen, he had to be standing somewhere. <laughs> Where was he standing? Did he have like a little piece of dirt here that he was standing on and then made and then jumped onto the earth which led the other girls to go back and this back and forth went back and forth back and forth back and forth and you could sense the tension and you could sense the right fighter in Ainsley coming out and you begin to sense that she was losing this argument and so she did what every right fighter does she came at him with something else and this is what was said and I'm not lying I'm not making this up she said well okay whatever but I know this Adam and Eve are responsible for that coronavirus thing <laughs> Dude, I'm losing it. I'm like, are you typing this down? Are you getting this? This is so good. Because technically, I guess they are, right? I mean, there was no illness before sin entered the world. So I'm like, well, maybe they are responsible. But isn't it amazing? Listen, isn't it amazing the things that we will argue? Isn't it? No, listen. Isn't it amazing the things that we have to be right about? Think about this for a second. I sat in the uh, driver's license place, get my license renewed, and these two uh, older gentlemen were adamant. This was about two weeks ago. One of them was adamant that we got six inches of rain the week before. The other one was just as adamant that it was five. I know, what a discrepancy, right? And they were going at each other. I've seen some DMV fights before, but it's usually over like the pitcher or, you know, uh, something or a felony or something like that. Rain. And so the longer I listened to this and the longer that I could hear about how his gauge was better than this guy's gauge because of how he hangs his rain gauge and all this other stuff, it dawned on me. It literally did because I could pick up on their conversation. They lived on opposite ends of the county. Now think about how big Wood County is. Yeah. All right? And I'm sitting here thinking, I'm like, all right, dudes, I didn't say this, but I'm like, six, five, who cares? What's the most important thing? We got rain. Yeah. We needed rain, we got it. Yeah. Who cares if it was six? Who cares if it was five? How many of you have ever been in an argument, iPhone over Android? Come on. I, dude, I used to do, listen. I used to fight so hard. I've had both of them. John's smiling at me, a tech guy. He was smiling at me right now. But listen, <laughs> iPhone users will argue to the death that iPhones are the best phones. Android users will argue to the death that Androids are the best phones because iPhones can do this, but Androids can do this, but iPhones can do this, but Androids can do this. And look, time out. If I'm stranded in the middle of a desert, all I want is a phone that can make a phone call. <laughs> Amen. And some of you are still using flip phones, and you know what I'm saying. It's not the most important thing. It's a good topic, but it's not the most important. How about diets? Right now, keto is taking over the world. I think keto may be the Antichrist, taking over the world. <laughs> Keto diets, the best diet you can go on is keto. And you don't want to know why the keto people say it's the best diet you can go on? Because you can still have bacon. That's their only argument. <laughs> And then you've got the Mediterranean folks over here who've never been to the Mediterranean but would swear the Mediterranean diet is the best diet. Then you've got Weight Watchers. Ashley has an aunt that swears by Weight Watchers. If you're not doing Weight Watchers, you will not lose weight. Okay, whatever. We can argue this till Jesus comes back. But what's the most important thing when we talk about our health? Take in less calories, exercise a little bit, three-fourths of your plate. If it comes out of the ground, you're fine. Okay, you're fine. It doesn't matter. It's not the most important thing. Investments. This is one of my favorites because everybody knows a guy, right? You know a guy. I know a guy. I know somebody that could really teach you how to invest your money. You need to be doing this and you need to be doing that. And then I'll go over here and the guy will say, oh, you don't need to do that at all. You need to do this. You need to do that. And you listen to it long enough and you're like, ah, I just want five bucks in my savings account. Can anybody help me get to that point? <laughs> 
What's the most important thing when it comes to our finances? Let's give God 10. Let's put 10 away for a rainy day and let's try to live off 80. Let's live below our means so we're not in debt. To me, that would be the most important thing. Where am I going with all this? Glad you asked. We're starting a series entitled Of First Importance. That's the title of the series, Of First Importance. And my goal today especially is not to pick a fight. I need you to hear me say this. I'm not trying to pick a fight, okay? I'm not trying to throw conviction on anybody. I'm not trying to single anybody out. I'm not, that's not my goal. This comes from a personal conviction. This comes from a, about a year's journey. I, I just celebrated my 18th spiritual birthday, so I've been walking with Christ for 18 years. And thank you. And over the last year, I've begun to realize something in me that I project onto y'all, but I do see it a lot. Edward used to tell me in the early days, Jake, if you'll preach out of your weaknesses, you will never, ever, ever, ever run out of material. And so this is a conviction. I always have to be right. And there have been things over the last 18 years or so that I've had to be right about. That now I look back and I say, did that really matter? <laughs> Seriously. I spent all that energy and all that time trying to convince somebody of this have I maybe missed the most important thing? Have I maybe missed what's of first importance? Now stay with me, because we're gonna be looking over the next four week, four to five weeks of that very thing. What is of first importance? When we have to be right, when we just have to be right, are we being right about the right things? When we have to convince somebody of something, are we convincing them of the most important things? Where are our priorities? Because most of us, if not all of us, love a good fight. We love a good argument, and we love to be right. And so let's just briefly, without stepping on anybody's toes, again, this is not, I'm not trying to pick a fight. I'm just, these are things that are floating out there right now that we have to be right on. Let's look at some of them. Predestination. Calvinist versus Armenians. And if you don't know what that means, you're one of the lucky ones. <laughs> don't get too caught up in it. But think about it. We have to be right about that, right? Everybody's got a view. Everybody's got a stance on that. And your view is right. And mine is wrong. And my view is right. And yours is wrong. Water baptism. The end times. We have to be right about that, right? My view is right. Your view is wrong. Your view is right? My view is wrong, okay? And there's three, and there are three main ones, and then from those three, you've got all these subs, so there's like 300 and something different views of that. But somebody out there, and you, it may be your lucky day, somebody's got the right view, right? Speaking in tongues, Holy Spirit, all that stuff. You've got a view, I've got a view, she's got a view, Oprah, everybody gets a view, everybody. <laughs> Tattoos, just got quiet. <laughs> Tattoos. <laughs> Women in the church. We got to be right about that. We have to be right about that. Here's one. This is where it gets a little dangerous. Is it a 6,000 year old earth or is it a 6 billion year old earth? Was Earth created in six literal days, or was it created over a period of time? How old is the planet we live on? And then here's a new caveat that's creeped in over the last year or so. Is it a flat Earth or a round Earth? You laugh. You laugh. There's a whole group of Christians now. They are convinced that the Earth is flat, and then they can back it up with Scripture. And that's great. And that's great if you're up at midnight and you've got some time and you want to YouTube and watch all these guys argue over this. But is it really that important? I mean, Jesus can conquer a flat earth. He can conquer a round earth. He can conquer an old earth. He can conquer a new earth. Who cares? <laughs> Was Jesus, if he were alive today, would he be a Republican or Democrat? Hello. <laughs> yeah. And what I find, listen, and what I find, myself included, is we spend a lot of energy and we spend a lot of time and we spend a lot of the platform that God has given us arguing and trying to convince people of our view of any one of those plus a thousand, thousand more. When there's something out there 
that's way more important. We're coming up on Easter. And isn't it, not coincidence, but isn't it need of God that he would give us this series in March to talk about the one thing that the Apostle Paul told the Corinthians was the most important thing. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And while you're turning there, I want to talk a little bit about the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church was a jacked up church. That's the only way I know how to explain it. These people were... Very unique, okay? And there were a lot of things going on in that church at this time. They were in the middle of what you would call a culture war, okay? And here's what you've got to understand when you read through the book of Corinthians, when you read the stuff that, that I'm about to talk about. These were not lost people that didn't know Jesus. These were believers that were engaging in a lot of this stuff. This is just a few of the things that were going on in the church of Corinth. Number one, there was a lot of partisanship between the Corinthians and they were beginning to build factions behind different leaders. In other words, one preferred Paul, and one preferred Apollos, and one preferred Cephas. It would be like me coming up and preaching today, and everybody that's Team Edward leaves. Because you don't like me, you prefer Edward. Or it'd be like Edward comes to speak, and everybody that prefers me gets up and leaves. Because you prefer me and not Edward. That was going on in the church. They had their favorite teachers, and then they began to divide the church. Prostitution and incest was going on in the Corinthian church. Amongst believers, marriage infidelity was going on in the church. Idolatry was beginning to creep in. Among, these are believers. Women were praying in immodest ways, according to their standards. Chaos in worship. People were speaking in tongues. They couldn't interpret it. Uh, there was just a bunch of chaos. Lawsuits among believers. People were taking other people to court and suing them. It was party time at communion in the Corinth church. They were using communion to overeat and get drunk. And it was just out of control. And so Paul writes this letter and he begins to address some of this stuff. Now, if I told you that in the church there was partisanship, prostitution, idolatry, marital infidelity, chaos in worship, that we were suing each other, and that we were getting drunk and overeating at communion, what would you think of a church like that? Yeah. Yeah. That's what was going on. And so Paul comes in and he begins to address these things. But there was something else going on in this church that put all of these on the back burner. You say, yeah, what in the world could be more important than people prostituting themselves in church? What could be more important than addressing the incest and the idolatry and the infidelity that was going on in church? To me, that would be really important. What could be more important than Christians suing other Christians, getting drunk at communion, causing chaos in worship? To me, that stuff needs to be addressed. And it was addressed. But there was something more going on. There was a group of people that had infiltrated that Corinth church and they were beginning to spread a doctrine that there was no resurrection of the dead. Now think about this for a second. Not only were these Corinthians partying it up as believers, but now they were beginning to teach and beginning to preach and beginning to believe that there was no resurrection of the dead. And if there was no resurrection of the dead, that means that Christ wasn't raised from the dead. And if Christ isn't raised from the dead, guess what? We've got a huge problem. And so while incest and prostitution and marital infidelity and, and chaos in worship and lawsuits, while that does need to be addressed, we've got a bigger issue going on where if we don't address the theology of the resurrection, none of that other stuff matters. Amen. It doesn't matter. And so Paul writes this, verse 1, chapter 15, 1 Corinthians. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, 
in which you stand and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you unless you believed in vain. Let me stop right there. Paul says, let me remind you of something. Let me remind you of the gospel. The gospel by which you are being saved. Now when he addressed all of these other topics, he never used language like this. But he gets to this one topic and he says, I need to remind you of something. I need to remind you of what I spoke and what I preached and the message I brought to you when I first showed up in Corinth. And by the way, it's what saved you. Verse 3, for what I deliver to you as of first importance, what I also received for myself, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles, Last of all, as to one untimely board, he appeared also to me. For what I delivered to you as of in first importance. Remember, I've got to remind you. This is Paul talking to Corinth. I've got to remind you of this gospel that I preached. This gospel by which you were saved. That what I preached to you was of First importance, that Christ died in accordance with the scriptures. He fulfilled a prophecy that he was buried in accordance with the scriptures and that he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. And then he appeared to over 500 people to prove that he was alive. There was witnesses and that he also appeared to me. That is the most important thing, okay? Doesn't matter what kind of diet you're on, as long as you're losing weight, right? Doesn't matter what kind of phone you use, as long as you're not stranded somewhere without a way to make a phone call. It doesn't matter what kind of investments you have, as long as you're not in debt to your eyeballs. It doesn't matter how much rain we got, as long as we got some rain. And what Paul is saying is at the end of the day, a lot of the stuff that we address and a lot of the stuff that we try to convince people of and a lot of the stuff that we do and say and argue about, if we don't have this nailed down, it doesn't mean much of anything. Whoever's creeping in trying to tell you there's no resurrection of the dead, it's almost like, and this is a dangerous statement, and listen, I don't condone any of this stuff that the Corinth church was doing. In fact, I think most of it is disgusting. But it's almost as if he was saying, he, he addresses that and he gets to this point and he's like, you know, it's almost like, man, I don't even want to say it. But without the resurrection of the dead, I mean, who cares? Let them do it. I mean, I, I know that's wrong, but I'm just saying that their hope is in Christ. And Christ is the only one that saves. And so without Christ, it's almost like I have this saying, I don't expect lost people to act like me. I don't expect people who don't know Jesus to be held up to Jesus' standards. To me, that's, that's the most ridiculous thing that we do in church. This is a sidebar. I'm just get myself in trouble. But if they don't know Jesus, they're not going to act like Jesus. So why do we hold them to a standard of acting like Jesus when they don't know him? And it's like Paul was saying, like, you're doing all this stuff... And you're Christians, you ought not to be doing this. But the most important thing we need to address is you're denying the resurrection of Christ. That is the most important thing. Why is it more important than prostitution? Why is it more important than marriage infidelity? Why is it more important than idolatry? Why is it more important than getting drunk at communion? Because without the resurrection of Christ, there's no Christianity. There's no church. There's no ecclesia, which is a gathering of, of people who are following Jesus. The resurrection is the central tenet of our faith. The resurrection is an event that happened in time roughly 2,000 years ago that changed the course of history, both spiritually and secularly. People who curse God and don't believe in Him still go by a timeline that was set by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It changed everything. It tore the veil and gave Gentiles like you and me who were not allowed to worship the one true God, by the way, in the Old Testament. It gave us access to the one true God. 
Creation didn't do that. If women can pray in church didn't do that. Theology on tattoos didn't do that. The resurrection did that. Amen. And Paul's getting very stern to these Corinthians. He's like, look, do I want you sleeping with each other? No. Do I want you in adultery? No. Do I want you suing each other? No. But let's move all that over here. What are you doing with the resurrection? Stop. There's no hope outside of that. Paul goes on to say in verse 12, he's, he's, fixing to get, he's fixing to get pretty poignant. Go back and read 1 Corinthians and he says a lot of stuff in those other issues, but he's, fixing to, he's really fixing to say some things that will mess you up. In verse 12 he says, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. Think about this. He didn't say that about idolatry. He didn't even say that about prostitution. He said, but you deny the resurrection, your faith is useless. Think about what he's saying. You might as well be sleeping with everybody. You might as well be a drunkard. You might as well be this. Because there's no hope for you. Amen. There's no hope for you. If Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, then we're just a country club. Verse 15, more than that, we are now found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But if he did not raise him from the dead, then the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ hasn't been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, listen to these words. Your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Wait a second. You really want to be messed up? He didn't say anything about still being in sins when people were sleeping with people and having incest and prostituting out their children. Why didn't he say that then? That'll mess you up. That'll mess you up. But you deny the resurrection, you're still in your sins. Think about this. It's crazy. Again, I don't condone any of that. I don't practice any of that. I think it's disgusting what they were doing. But at the end of the day, grace, we're saved by grace. Do you realize, man, how much time do I have? Do you realize God could have saved you and killed you on the same day? But he didn't do that. And we're never going to be perfect. Which means there's going to be a period of our life, for me it's going to be 27 until the day I die, where I am both a sinner and a saint. Where I have the Holy Spirit, but I still live in the flesh. Where I sin, but it's covered by grace. I know you can go down a messy road here, but it's the truth. But without the resurrection of the dead, then I ain't nothing and it doesn't really matter. That's got to be the most important thing is what Paul was saying. He said, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins if you discount the resurrection. Then he goes on to say, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. Ever had a loved one pass away? Hey, if there's no resurrection of the dead, guess what? She gone. He gone. Dust to dust, back to the earth. There's no hope there. That's, Paul's trying to build a case. Do you realize the road you're going on if you deny the resurrection of Christ? Do you realize? There's still hope for you if you're in idolatry. <laughs> I'm telling you, this will mess you up. If you're prostituting yourself out, there's still hope for you. But if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, there's no hope for you or for anybody else. Verse 20, he says, But indeed, Christ has been raised from the dead in the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So where am I going with this? I think I need to be reminded, and I think we need to be reminded of where our hope is found. I think we need to be reminded 
or we at least need to be aware of the messages that we preach and the messages that we teach and the conversations that we have and the arguments that we have and the topics that we have to be right about. All of them are fascinating topics. Fascinating. Was Jonah swallowed by a whale or a fish? We teach our kids well, but it doesn't say that in the Bible. It says big fish. So which one was it? Boy, you could spend a lot of energy on that. Did Eve eat an apple? We teach our kids she ate an apple, but nowhere in Scripture does it say apple. That's crazy, but we'll spend a lot of energy. The planet thing fascinates me. It really does. The women in church, we could, man, we could beat that to death. What are we trying to convince people of? When we engage lost people, lost people are people that don't know Christ. So they act a certain way and they believe a certain way because they don't have Jesus. We don't need to be scared of that, folks. Okay, we just don't. A lot of us are scared to engage in conversation with people who don't know Jesus. Don't be afraid of it. I have engaged in conversation with lost people. Three of my really good friends are atheists. We have fascinating conversations. And we could go down some rabbit trails. Oh my gosh, could we go down some rabbit trails. But here's what I've got to remind myself of when I'm arguing to these people who don't believe God exists anyway. And I'm trying to argue with them and I'm trying to convince them that, you know, Jonah really did get swallowed by a fish. Like he was a real guy and it was a real fish. Where I've got another guy over here saying, no, that's just allegory. That's a story to, to paint a bigger God-like principle. Oh, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. And then you get in this argument and you're like, and then you're back to Adam and Eve started the coronavirus. <laughs> because you've run out of stuff to talk about. And I'm serious. And they're fascinating. But here's what I know, and here's what I've got to remind myself of. When I was 27 years old and my life was spiraling out of control, and I had no hope and I had no purpose in life, the last thing I needed was for somebody to come preach to me about a young earth, old earth, flat earth, round earth, orbit this, orbit that, there's life on Mars, Jonah was real, Adam and Eve didn't have belly buttons, the skin, they were naked. I didn't need any of that. I needed to know that there was something bigger than myself. That Christ really was alive. That that was a true story and that he had conquered death and he could save me and give me a new life. And when I got my mind wrapped around that and stepped into that, that's what changed my life. And so when I have these conversations with lost people, I've got to remind myself the hope that they need is not found in any of this other cool talking point stuff. The hope that they need is found in Jesus and specifically his death, burial, and resurrection. What are we telling people, lost people? What are we reminding people of? What are we reminding Christians of at their lowest point in their life? Christians do still struggle, you know. Christians do go through dark times, you know. Christians will have seasons where they feel like they're losing their hope. What do we remind them of? We had, Ashley and I had Boston in 2006. We had Ainsley in 2009. In the three years in between, we had four miscarriages. One of which was a tubal, and it was very serious. They had to rush her in before she bled out and do an emergency surgery. It's very, very serious stuff. If you know my wife, you know my wife is a mother hen that loves children. Loves children. She always wanted a big family. Now, we're both happy. We're blessed. We have a healthy teenage son and a healthy 10-year-old girl and uh, wouldn't trade it for the world, but we always dreamed we'd have five or six kids. And there was a period of time in that three-year window before... Ainsley was conceived and that pregnancy was tough and that's another story that we didn't think we would ever have another baby. And we were at a low, low point in our walk with Christ. You know what got us out of that? It wasn't a silly convincing of a second baptism, of a predestination, of a young earth, of Jonah was real, if Adam and Eve did this, if David really killed Goliath the way the scripture says it was, it wasn't any of that. It was the reminder that, yeah, we lost three, uh, four uh, babies in miscarriage, 
But God's conquered all of that. And that God had raised himself from the dead and one day I'm going to rise too. And so at my lowest point in my Christian walk, I could turn to the cross and to the reality of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to know that that's where my hope, and if Ainsley had never been born, if we had never had another child, my faith was secure in that. What are we telling people at their lowest of the lows? What are we reminding them about? What is the most important thing in our message to people at their lowest point of their walk? See, my fear is, is that I have wasted a lot of my platform. And that I have wasted a lot of my energy trying to convince people on my view of Jonah and the whale. I mean fish, whale, fish, whale. That I've wasted a lot of my energy convincing people because I'm right about what Adam and Eve ate that day in the garden. That I've wasted a lot of my energy trying to convince people that are a whole lot smarter than me of my view of the earth and creation. It's a scary place to go, but if you'll step into some of these conversations, here's what you're going to find out. My atheist friends are smart, smart people. I mean, they're smart. They're sharp. And they know scripture better than I do, which is very convicting. Some of the professors, Ashley was a science minor, education, EC through fourth, and then she had a, a fifth through eighth certification in science. And I remember early in our marriage, I'd quiz her and stuff like that. Dude, there's some, there's some science out there that'll it'll make you think. It will. And if you engage, and if, that, if that's your goal, is to be right about the science of Scripture and to be right about um, the science of the earth and to be right about this and to be right about that, man, have fun. I've been doing it for 18 years and I'm tired. I'm tired. But you know, in all my conversations with my atheist friends and all my book studies and, and everything that I've seen on TV and hearing from the left and hearing from the right, you know something that's never been done? They've never found the bones of Jesus. And until they do... The most important topic on my mind is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because all this other stuff you can build a case for. You can build a case for young earth. You can build a case for old earth. You can. You can build a case for a lot of this. You can build a case for women in church. You can build a case for women out of church. You can build a case for tattoos. You can build a case against it. You can't build a case against the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ because they've never found any bones. And it's like Paul said... He's writing this letter, and most of the 500 people that saw a dead Jesus walk around were still alive. Why didn't they refute it? Because they couldn't, because it happened. It was real. And so what's the most important topic, church? Where is all of our energy going? I'm just to the point now, and maybe it's just me, a lot of this stuff is just wearing me out. And it all comes back to Jesus anyway. And so why don't we start there? <laughs> If it all is going to come back to him, why don't we just start there? And why don't we stay there for a little while? Because the mo there are people hurting. And the most important thing they need is hope. They need hope in a literal Jesus that was God in the flesh. That came to earth. And he was crucified. He was buried. And then he conquered the grave on the third day. Oh, and there's another argument. Was it three days? Was it not three days? Because, you know, Friday, Sunday, that's not three days. That's like two and a half days. Well, we counted, but, but. <clears throat> the resurrection, the most important thing. Now, I'm not saying all that other stuff isn't important. I'm not saying that in its proper context, it's not good, because it is. And there's a time and a place for that debate. There's a time and a place for that context. But let's remember what Paul was addressing here. Folks, he was addressing incest. Put that up against how old the earth is. There's no comparison. He was addressing idolatry. He was addressing prostitution. And yet, he still came back to all that other stuff outside of the context of the resurrection of Christ is futile. It's futile. This is our message. And so here's what I'm asking you to do. And I'm not even asking you to do it. Here's what I'm going to do. And I know this is a cop-out. You're saying, oh, it's a cop-out. You're supposed to give up beer. You're supposed to give up cigarettes. You're supposed to give up, you know, fried foods. But you know what I'm giving up for Lent? Those silly arguments. I'm tired of it. I'm not going to do it. 
For the next six weeks leading up to Resurrection Sunday, the only thing I want to talk about is Jesus. That's the only thing I want to talk about. And I'm asking you to get on the train and buckle up and go on a ride. Because in six weeks, we're going to be celebrating the one event that changed everything. And people are going to be coming to our church for the very first time. They're just going to be visiting. They're going to know what we're about. And what I want to do over the next six weeks is I want to tell them, this is what we're about. So in the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about death. Why did Jesus have to die? What did the death of Jesus mean? What does it mean for us? Are we talking about buried? What? Not how long was he buried, but why was he buried? And what does that look like for us? There's a, there's a lesson in there for us. We're going to be talking about risen. We're going to talk about that day he conquered the grave and what that means for us as believers and what it means for lost people that have no hope. And then this is going to be my favorite message of the whole thing. Like, I'm going to give you a pass on the first three. Like, you, just, as long as you're there for number four, because we're going to be talking about the ark of Jesus this weekend. You say, what do you mean the ark of Jesus this weekend? Well, you need to come back and find out because there was an ark to the weekend that is so applicable for us as believers in the message that we carry out into the world. You're not going to want to miss that. And so here's what we're going to do. Here's what I'm going to do for the next six weeks. You ready? Let's talk about Jesus. Now, if you got somebody in your family, they're prostituting themselves out, you might want to address that. Probably not healthy. If you got somebody in your family and they're drugs and all this, I mean, yeah, I get it. Address that. But let's try to stay away from the things that at the end of the day really don't matter. I'm never going to, listen, there's something, you're just never going to convince them. They've got too much college degree in them. They've got too much blah, 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 blah. But until they can find the bones of Jesus, I'm engaging in that conversation. I am, because that's where their hope is. Let's talk about Jesus. And then let's see what God does over the next five to six weeks. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. If you're visiting with us this morning, I want to say thank you for being here. Uh, we like to end um, every week uh, in a short time of response. So what we do is we have communion tables that are set up, two in the front, two in the back. Um, the band's about to come back and play. And uh, we're going to invite you to take communion as a family. Uh, we're also going to have some of our elders, some of our elders' wives, and some of our prayer team members. They're going to be along the front. If you need to respond through prayer, if you need somebody to pray over you, or if God's tugged on your heartstrings this morning, then we invite you to do that. And so we're going to give you an opportunity to take communion. We're going to give you an opportunity to come forward and pray. And then we're going to ask you to go back to your seats, and we're going to end in worship. Let's pray together. Father God, you're good. Thank you for Jesus. And God, thank you for the reminder of what, what he did and how um, important it is. Father, I pray for each and every one of us this morning. God, if you're speaking to our hearts, Father, that we would not be afraid to respond. Thank you for this time as we worship, as we take communion, as um, we dismiss. May you be glorified in everything we do. We love you. In Christ's name, amen. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen, and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day, and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.